Okay. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah. So, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm uh, Michael Miguel Reynal. I work at Bootlin, formerly Free Electrons. Uh, just before starting, uh, who knows Free Electrons at least or using services? Okay. So we are renaming the company uh, because of a legal uh, legal dispute. Uh, if you want more information, you can go to our check our website uh, bootlin.com. Um, otherwise, it's exactly the same. Uh, we are just uh, renaming it. Same people inside, same purpose, uh, sharing and contributing. On my side, I work a lot. Uh, I contributed quite a lot to the non subsystem the last the last months, and. Um, Sometimes on, uh, I contribute also on Armada, uh, Armada SOCs. So this talk is about uh, non-memories, non-flash memories. Uh, initially, I wanted to talk uh, about the Linux stack mainly. But while I was writing the slides, I found it was kind of boring to spend an hour on that. So I added an, a first introduction uh, on the physical uh, part, how it works actually, physically. And uh, I will talk uh, mostly about, uh, uh, at the end of the talk, I will spend some time on the execop interface, which is a new one which is currently being added in the Linux kernel to do some uh, low-level stuff. I'm not a non-expert. Uh, if you disagree with me, please go talk to Boris Brazilian, the non-maintainer, which is in this room. Uh, I will probably simplify some aspects on the electrical uh, part. I won't, I won't talk about no flashes at all, just non-flashes, and especially uh, SLC NAND, which stands for uh, single, single level cell. It's when you have only one bit per uh, memory cell. Uh, it's for simplifying the explanations. Okay, uh, before starting the technical part, just uh, some uh, commercial information. Um, NANDs uh, were supposed to replace hard, hard disk drives. Um, the main goal was to have the lowest cost per bit. We'll see how, we, how they achieved that uh, with the design, the hardware design. And you can find them uh, in a lot of flavors. I will talk about raw NANDs and while why, uh, how you drive them uh, with a non-controller, but you can also find them uh, on spy buses. And uh, there are a lot of uh, more and more managed, managed NANDs under the form of uh, EMMCs, SSDs, uh, USB sticks, and so on. So yeah, first, let's build our uh, NAND cell, uh, our non-memory cell. I will start very deep into the matter with the silicon atom. There is a nucleus with 14 protons and around it 14 electrons. It makes it uh, electrically neutral. This is very important. On the last orbit, there are four, electro, um, four valence electrons. It's called the valence shell. For uh, each electron, will bond with another uh, electron on, uh, of another uh, silicon atom, and it will make uh, the crystal. In a perfect world at zero Kelvin, the absolute zero, uh, you won't have any current with uh, silicon. It's almost an insulator, but uh, at 20 degrees, uh, 20 Celsius degrees, uh, you have uh, some, you, you get energy from, for instance, the light, and if light strokes an electron, it will jump into the other the upper orbit with uh, much more energy, and this is a free electron which can carry electricity. Of course, if you don't apply uh, any voltage, it will just drift randomly until it loses its energy and combine back into the hole it created. So to make use of uh, silicon and make them more uh, conductive, people invented doping. And 
do the purpose of doping is adding impurities in the silicon crystal. And these impurities are atoms that, are, that have one more or one less electrons on their valence shell. So doing that, you, can, uh, you put another atom in, uh, in place of a silicon atom. It will bind, let's say, with four other silicon atoms with uh, its four electrons on the valence shell. But one electron will remain and won't bond with any other uh, atom. And this is a free electron. It can carry electricity. Uh, if you add more electrons, it's end up being, of course, if you have uh, three electrons instead of four on the valence shell, it's uh, p-doping for positive. You have a hole. It's actually a lack of electrons. OK, let's put uh, two uh, differently doped areas together. You make a PN junction. The electrons close to the junction will, uh, on the N side will jump over the junction and combine into holes on the P side. It makes uh, both regions not electrically neutral. And one will be positive in the N side and one will be negative on the P side because matter was electrically neutral, is electrically neutral, but you added electrons on a side which uh, was already neutral. So it, there are more electrons than, before the, than protons in this area, and it makes it uh, negative. It creates an uh, electric field here, a barrier that is hard to cross for other electrons on this side that cannot combine with all the holes on the P side. So you don't have, uh, yeah. Let's apply a voltage on it. Electrons, uh, if you apply a plus voltage on the end side, electrons will be attracted, but uh, you, are, you won't have uh, any current, actually. But if you apply the plus voltage on the P side, electrons that were, on the, that were close to the, jun the junction will jump from hole to hole until they get out of the circuit, while other electrons on the end side will be able to jump across the barrier, and this will uh, imply a current. Let's have now what's, what we call a MOSFET. Uh, it's uh, two N regions separated by a P region, OK? Me uh, MOSFET is a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So metal oxide semiconductor is actually the, this part. The leg in the middle is called the gate. It's metal, OK? It's uh, separated from the P substrate, which is also called the bulk. Uh, by an oxide, which is an insulator. So there you can, you can have uh, actual electricity, uh, uh, elect uh, electrons moving from here to here. If you apply a, a voltage across the ex external legs, it's the first case we had before with the PN junction, you won't have any current. If you also apply a plus voltage on the, on the gate, you will have uh, positive charges here on the gate that will attract electrons and create a small channel so electrons could go from one end side to the other one. And this creates a current. So this is uh, the basic of a uh, transistor. Um, we all agree that here we cannot store data yet. And what we want to build is a memory cell. So people added uh, what we call a floating gate here. The floating gate is separated from the, rest, from the other parts with an insulator. OK. So there is no current going through it. And same as before, if you apply a voltage across the external legs and a positive voltage on the, on the gate, you will still have your charges there that will attract electrons and create this channel, same as before, then you have uh, a current flowing. But if you have electrons in the floating gate in the center here, uh, holes are not repealed anymore and instead are attracted here. And it makes the, uh, the jump too high for the electrons in the end uh, regions. 
So there you don't you can't have any more current even if you apply a plus voltage on the gate. And that's why that's how you store a zero, a logic zero. The previous condition was a logic one when there was current. So the question is how do we put electrons in the floating gate? We do that with uh, what we call the Fowler nodine tunneling effect. It's quantum mechanics. Um, basically, you will apply a high, neg a high positive volta voltage on the, on the gate, much higher than before. So electrons will be attracted and will tunnel through the oxide layer because they are attracted here by all the positive charges on the gate. Um, this region, uh, this oxide is a bit uh, thicker than this one, so uh, electrons could tunnel through this one, but not through this one. Otherwise, you, won't, you wouldn't have any, any charges stored. So this is called uh, programming a cell to a zero state, because once you have elect electrons there, you, don't, you can't have any more current there. In the other way around, if you want to raise a cell, you have to apply a high negative voltage on the, on the gate. So putting a lot of electrons on the gate, repealing all the electrons in the floating gate back into the substrate. This is my MOSFET, my, actually my floating gate transistor, but uh, the figure is just much simpler. Uh, you still have the floating gate here. This was the gate, also called the world line, we'll see why. And uh, both external legs are called the bit line. If we put two cells like that in series, uh, well, we are supposed to have two NPN regions uh, side by side, but what we do to gain space is to have only one region between them. And when you create your... Uh, you chip, you just have to uh, put N regions regularly on a P substrate, and that's all. And you get your N, P, N, P, N regions. It makes the layout very, very thin, and that's why you can have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of memory cells on a small area. Just a side note, uh, imagine you apply a voltage across both uh, transistors. If you want to get a, zero, a logic zero on this, at this spot, on this spot, you'll have to apply a, a logical one on both gates to make both transistors passing and have the zero here. And this is the NAND gate. Uh, this explains the name of the uh, technology. Okay, we've created one cell. Now we want a bit more than only one bit in our chip, so we put them in series. This is a string of cells. We can put as much cell as we want uh, in series, but you know, uh, if you want the current to be passing through the transistors, uh, when it, it's about silicon, it's about 8.7 volts, so we limit ourselves to uh, 32 to 64 uh, cells on strings uh, in, in series, after it would be too much for embedded system, for instance. So if you want to read uh, the value of one cell inside the string, you have to apply a positive voltage on the gate, as we've seen before. But if all the uh, transistors are not passing, you won't have anything, uh, you won't have any current on this string, okay? So what you have to do is to add an even higher voltage on all the other gates of the other cells in the same string, so the other ones are forced to be passing. This voltage cannot be too high, or you will have the tunneling effect. Okay, now you can feel how, it, how fragile uh, this design may be. So this is a string, but uh, you can put a lot of strings in parallel. It makes a block. And uh, as I told you earlier, the gate is now called the, the word line because all the gates 
are connected together and are making what we call a page. If you are used to deal with non flash uh, a block, a page are terms that you usually meet. And when you want to select, let's say you want to program this cell. Actually, by selecting this cell and applying a high uh, voltage on this gate, you will actually select all the cells in that string, on, in that page, actually. And that's why you can only program and read uh, entire pages at a time with non flash. Uh, if I go back a few slides, you remember when I talked about uh, erasing the erasing the cells uh, uh, by by moving out the the electrons from the floating gate. Actually, I told you uh, we could apply a high negative voltage on the gate, but high negative voltage are not as easy to obtain. So what we do instead is applying a high positive voltage on the bulk on the P substrate. That that has the exact same effect of uh, attracting electrons out of the floating gate. One difference, a big difference, the bulk is shared across all the cells in one block. So when you want to erase a cell, you actually have to erase the whole block. And that's why we call that flash memory, because it's highly parallelized. Um, a few words about bit flips. It's when you expect uh, one logical value and actually you get another one. Cells, um, no, yeah, uh, the follow no dime effect, it's quantum mechanics. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's stochastically distributed. It means hazards come into the equation and you, can actually, you cannot actually know exactly how much electrons you will have in your floating gate. Uh, otherwise, there are other effects. A uh, cell might not be fully erased or programmed. Um, for instance, electrons that tunnel through the oxide layer might not cross the entire oxide if they, not, if they don't get enough energy and get trapped into the, into the insulator. It makes uh, regions of the insulator negatively, electrically negative, and prevents all the electrons from from tunneling through that barrier. Also, there is data retention. Uh, it's when you store data in one cell, you put your NAND away for um, for months or years, maybe ten years. You you get it back, and when you look at the data in it. Uh, some, some cells that were programmed to zero are actually one because the, the electrons, when they tunnel through the oxide layer, they can also, they collide with material and damage it a bit. So the insulator might not be an insulator uh, completely uh, fine anymore. And with time, uh, electrons can get out of it. And also, there are read-write disturbances. Uh, when you read and write pages, uh, you apply uh, voltages across the cells be, um, just next to, the, to, to, to other pages, and yeah, it creates disturbances. For an SLC NAND, uh, it's about uh, 100,000 program and erase cycles. For MLC, for instance, it's much less than that. Uh, I haven't talked about MLC. It's a, a multi-level cell. Uh, when you put multiple bytes in one memory cell. But it's not very, very stable. So, okay. We now know how a uh, non flash is built. We have our non chip, and we now want to drive it. Um, I'm still talking only about parallel NANDs. Uh, you'll have to wire it to your non controller. Um, this is defined in some uh, non protocol there, there are uh, non specifications for that and uh, I will explain briefly the logic here. Um, you have a IO bus okay it 's eight bit wide or sixteen bit wide, and a few logic lines for instance c e stands for uh, chip enable the non controller of the host will assert this line when it wants to talk to a particular non chip actually the 
this is uh, for enabling one die. You may have multiple dice in one chip, but I will simplify this. And let's say we have uh, we have only one die in in this chip. The ready buzzy pin works in the other way around. The non chip can assert and deassert it to indicate that it's buzzy and it cannot do another operation. Write protect WP it uh, to let the non chip know that it cannot accept uh, neither uh, write operations nor erase operations. And uh, I will get back right after for these lines. First, I want to show you uh, the non protocol, how it works. Um, basically, there are three uh, possible cycles that can happen on the bus. Command cycles, address cycles, and data cycles. And you can have wait periods. It's when the read buzzy pin is actually uh, uh, de by the non-chip. So when a command cycle is asserted on the bus, the non-chip knows that it's a command, it's a command because the command latch enable uh, pin is uh, also asserted. Same happens for the address latch enable pin and read enable, write enable are for data when uh, the non controller is the master of the bus or when the non chip is the master of the bus. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, when controller address are uh, asserted on the bus, it's always. Uh, a right, and it's already this one that is asserted because the non controller is the master. So, when you put together uh, command address data and wait cycles that are non instructions, you get a full non operation. So, let's say how it looks a real uh, non operation. Uh, my first example is uh, how to do a read page. You have to send uh, the zero byte, which is a command to, to tell the non-chip we're going to do a read operation. Then a few address cycles, okay, where, the, where I want to read. Then the 30 command, which means, okay, now you can bring the data. There the non-chip will tell the host he is retrieving the data and he has to wait a bit. And then a uh, few data cycles, depending on how much data you asked for. Um, some commands are a bit less complicated. For instance, the reset one, it's just the FF command, one byte. And then the chip will reset itself and uh, deassert the ready buzzy pin the time it's buzzed. Controllers um, yeah, I, are often embedded in SOCs. There are diverse implementations of them. Some are really simple. Others are quite complicated. Oh, I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Its main job is just to communicate with the non chip. Uh, it can embed uh, more logic, for instance, uh, it can handle, uh, it can have an ECC, ECC engine. ECC is for error correct, uh, correcting code, yes, to handle bit flips in the pages, or advanced logic to enhance the throughput. So net, now um, we know how the, the electrical part works. What it is to talk to a non-chip with a non-protocol. So let's see how it's done uh, in Linux. This is the MTD stack. MTD stands for uh, Mass Technology Device. When you want to interact with your non-chip, you will pass through these layers. So some of you may know the UBI, UBI FS layers. I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, it's a bit out of scope. The MTD layer is um, an abstraction level. You, from here, you don't know exactly what uh, it's inside, uh, if it's NAND or another technology another technology. You'll go through the non-core, which is the framework where all the logic must be. And the non-core will uh, make some orders to the controller driver. Uh, that will drive, actually, the non-controller. Okay. In terms of software, 
Uh, I don't know if you can see it's a bit blurry, I'm sorry. Let's say you want to, to make a read on the non device. You will, uh, from the US user space, you will uh, use the slash dev slash MTD X device. It will go through the MTD layer, okay? And the non core will first uh, use the, non, uh, the command func hook, which is supposed to be in the non core. It was actually at the beginning. This hook will send a uh, We'll call the command control hook from the controller driver with either command or address cycles, one at a time. Then it can, it can make uh, wait periods with wait func and dev ready. There are other uh, hooks implemented in the controller driver. And uh, we'll retrieve or write data with the read write byte word buff um, uh, hooks that are in also in the controller driver. But, yeah, this is the linear view of the, 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 the functions that are called. This has some limitations now. I guess when command func was first introduced in the, in the kernel, it was uh, perfectly fine to do things like that. But today, um, controllers tend to be more complex and some of them actually need uh, to, order the wall, to do the whole operation at one time and cannot do such fine-grained instructions. Uh, for instance, sending just a command cycle, just an address cycle, and so on. So people started re-implementing the command func hook from their uh, controller driver. So this uh, was overloaded here. Problem is, command func doesn't embed the, uh, the data length you have to retrieve or to write. So, some prediction started being done from the non controller drivers. And it means the non core wasn't uh, fitting the need anymore. Also, uh, be, because all the implementations were really different. Uh, when a vendor adds a new operation, if you want to support this operation in the non-core, you have to patch all the controller drivers one by one. It's a lot, it's a lot of pain to maintain. And uh, yeah, because uh, developers started to implement only minimal set of commands just to make they, their own uh, situation work, um, yeah, it was incomplete. So, to address these limitations, we decided to add another hook in Linux called execop, uh, which is just a translation into, uh, into an operation of what the MTD core wants to achieve. The NAND core will actually call the implementation of execop from the controller driver giving him an array of all the instructions he wants to, to execute to do one NAND operation. I'm going to detail that. Uh, it should enter 4.16 uh, in a few weeks. And uh, the first uh, driver that, is the, that has been migrated to use this interface is the Marvel NAND controller. And other are coming. Uh, if you want to see a very simple implementation, you can have a look. Uh, I have sent some patches for the SF FSMC driver. It's really simple. Uh, all the drivers, or the controller drivers, are going to be merged, uh, are going to be migrated anytime soon. I hope. So, yeah. What? What, you have, what do you have to do in the uh, execop implementation from the controller driver's side? You will receive an array of the instructions. First, you have to pass the, sequ the sequence and split it in as much sub-operation as needed. If you, can't, if, if you think your uh, controller won't handle this operation, you have to return an error. And this is another difference uh, with the common func approach 
where no, no error code was uh, returned if the operation cannot be handled, couldn't be handled. This way, um, the non-core will be able to maybe try another way. There are multiple ways to do the same thing with NAND, and the non-core will be able to try uh, with, other, uh, other, with another operation to do the same thing, even if the throughput is a bit... Uh, if you lose, if you lose a, a, a bit of throughput. So yeah, for, simple, for simple controllers, when you can split the operation in just the instructions, it's quite simple. You can do it by hand. Otherwise, we've introduced a parser in the core. So now, when you want to do, uh, let's say, a read, the main read operation in the non-core will now call the execop uh, hook from the controller driver. And if the implementation is a bit complicated, you can just call the parser from the NAND framework, giving him an array of supported patterns. Each supported pattern has a callback, and the parser will go through the patterns, and whenever it finds one that fits the needs of the desired operation, it will call the callback with the, just the sub-operation that matches. This is an example of uh, what an array of supported pattern can be. It's a bit simplified, of course, um, just for the example. Okay, the, the, first, one, the, first, uh, the first pattern is one command cycle, up to five address cycles, and maybe if you need it, you can do also up to 1,024 data cycles. The numbers here are actually the maximum number of this kind of cycle that you can achieve because there are some limitations for that in the current controllers. The second one can either do a common, uh, assert a common cycle or a wait cycle or both. And the last one can just do some data transfers. If I go back to my first examples, um, the reset, of, re reset operation, which was a command cycle and then a wait period, well, the non-parser will find that the second pattern actually matches that and will execute this callback, and that's all. For instance, if you want to do a read ID, it's one command cycle, one address cycle, and let's say six uh, data cycles. The first pattern matches. Even if the number of cycles is not, are not the same, it's not a problem at all. And the first callback will be, uh, will be run. For the last example, the third one, the change read column, you want to assert a common cycle, then two address cycle, and another common cycle before, uh, date, before reading data. This cannot be handled by uh, any of the patterns here. So you'll have to split it into sub-operations. That is done with, by the parser automatically. And for instance, you will find that the three first cycles can be handled by the first pattern. So we'll call this callback with a sub operation that matches only these three cycles. Then you want a command cycle. So the second pattern can do that, just one command. And finally, you want data cycles that the third pattern can handle. So this callback will be called, but this time it will be called twice because you can only handle uh, 1,024 bytes at a time and 2,000 were requested. So yeah, that's how it works. And uh, what you should implement in the, your controller driver is this array and this callback. Of course, in the non-core, there are other hooks. Uh, the most important for me <laughs> was the execop one. But of course, uh, you have to deal with other ones. I, I, I want to speak a little bit about the setup data interface hook. This one uh, data interface is for uh, timings. Uh, maybe you know uh, non-timings can be of, uh, yeah, you have different speeds. The ONFI specifications has six of them. 
the slowest one, the mouse zero, is supported by all the NAND chips, should be supported by all the NAND chips. But let's say you want to achieve uh, the highest, highest throughput, you will, uh, you will have to set uh, on the, you, you will have to use, um, let's say, mode four or five that are really, uh, really fast. But for this, some tweaking, some, some, tweak, some configuration has to be done on the controller side. And this is handled by the setup data interface. So you give uh, a data interface, and first the controller driver will have to return if yes or no it can be handled by this controller. And if it can, it will have to, uh, to configure the controller to use this kind of timing for this chip. And when I say this chip, it's actually you can select the chip with this hook. Oh, uh, and each time you'll have to switch from one NAND chip to another one if your design is like this. You'll have to, uh, you'll have to, to switch from one timing mode to the other one. And this is done in the select chip. Also, even if the name is confusing, you actually select a die, not the entire chip. Some good habits. Um, yeah. When you hack into the NAND core, you should test. Of course, you should test, but you should use uh, probably these, uh, these binaries. They are from the MTD utils package. I use them a lot. Uh, if you are lost, I would say you can get the documentation, but uh, actually, this is a joke because there is almost none. But instead, you should uh, ping the MTD community. Um, there are a lot of people there that can help you. And do, please do not forget to put the non-maintainers in copy. It puts them in a quite bad mood. And I, I work uh, beside uh, one of them. If you want more information, you can check um, the presentation of Boris Brazilian. Yeah, him. Uh, he made a a talk at, the, at ELCE uh, in 2016 in Berlin uh, about the NAND framework, uh, something more general, and also about the physical part on, of NAND flashes. Uh, I would suggest you to have a look at the Arno, Arnaud van der Kappel uh, talk at the same conference. Uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I will be pleased to answer them. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, the, the question is about the future of uh, raw nouns. And uh, yeah, it was kind of announced that uh, raw nouns would disappear and be replaced by EMMCs. And it, it's slowly happening, but we face the fact that a lot of people are still using raw nouns, and there is still some work to do on this side. But yeah, probably in the next years, they will, the market share of raw nouns will decrease. Yeah. About spy, spy none, I can't answer you on that. But you can uh, add on. Uh, you can ask on the mailing list. <laughs> yes, or maybe. Yeah, you can come and talk to us at the end, maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, some work uh, has already been done to support. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is about the support of MLC uh, NANDs and uh, how this uh, could be used to 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 handle MLC, right? 
Um, actually, the, some, some uh, work has been done uh, about supporting MLCNAND in the Linux kernel. Uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated than uh, just uh, knowing that there are multiple bits in one cell because you have limitations on the fact that you, can, you cannot write uh, pages in the order you want. There are a lot of uh, problematics around that. And work has been done, but it's not uh, upstream yet, and uh, we, 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 we lack uh, some time to work on it. Uh, I think there was a last question there. No? Uh, if I know an other system that uses uh, this kind of mechanism, uh, actually, I'm pretty new to Linux, so no. <laughs> I have to be honest. Okay. Uh, if you have still have any questions, you can catch me and post them today. Otherwise, thank you very much.